The Determining Role of Economy Marx with Freud The topic of populism versus class struggle also raises a series of fundamental conceptual problems. Let us begin with a precise theoretical point about the status of universality. We are dealing here with two opposed logics of universality to be strictly distinguished. On the one hand, there is the state bureaucracy, as the universal class of a society, or in a larger scope, the US as the world policeman, the universal enforcer and guarantor of human rights and democracy, the direct agent of the global order. On the other hand, there is supernumerary universality, the universality embodied in the element which sticks out of the existing order, which, while internal to it, has no proper place within it, what Jacques Ranciere calls the part of no part. Not only are the two not the same, but the struggle is ultimately a struggle between these two universalities, not simply between the particular elements of the universality. Not just about which particular content will hegemonize the empty form of universality, but a struggle between two exclusive forms of universality themselves. This is why Leclerc misses the point when he opposes the working class and the people along the axis of conceptual content versus the effect of radical nomination. The working class designates a pre-existing social group characterized by its substantial content, while the people emerges as a unified agent through the very act of nomination. There is nothing in the heterogeneity of demand that predisposes them to be unified into a people. However, Marx distinguishes between the working class and the proletariat. The working class is indeed a particular social group, while the proletariat designates a subjective position. This is why Leclerc's critical debate about Marx's opposition between proletariat and lumpen proletariat also misses the point. The distinction is not one between an objective social group and a non-group a remainder excess with no proper place within the social edifice, but a distinction between two modes of this remainder excess, which generate two different subjective positions. The implication of Marx's analysis is that, paradoxically, although the lumpen proletariat seems more radically displaced with regard to the social body than the proletariat, it in fact fits much more smoothly into the social edifice. To refer to the Kantian distinction between negative and infinite judgment, the lumpen proletariat is not truly a non-group, the imminent negation of a group, a group which is a non-group, but not a group, and its exclusion from all strata not only consolidates the identity of other groups, but makes it a free-floating element, which can be used by any stratum or class. It can be the radicalizing carnivalesque element of the workers' struggle, pushing them from compromising moderate strategies to an open confrontation or the element which is used by the ruling class to denature from within opposition to its rule, the long tradition of the criminal mob serving those in power. The working class, on the contrary, is a group which is in itself as a group within the social structure, a non-group, that is, whose position is in itself contradictory. It is a productive force. Society and those in power need it in order to reproduce themselves and their rule, but nonetheless, they cannot find a proper place for it. Based on this misunderstanding, Leclerc puts forward a general argument rendered succinctly by Oliver Marchart. On a formal level, every politics is based on the articulatory logics of a combination and condensation of inconsistent attitudes, not only the politics of fascism. As a result, the fundamental social antagonism will always be displaced to some degree since, as we have noted earlier, the ontological level, in this case antagonism, can never be approached directly and without political mediation. It follows that distortion is constitutive for every politics. Politics as such, not only fascist politics, proceeds through distortion. This reproach remains caught in the binary tension between essence and appearance. The fundamental antagonism never appears as such. Directly, in a transparent manner, in Marx's terms, the pure revolutionary situation, in which all social tensions would be simplified, reduced to the class struggle, never takes place. It is always mediated by other ethnic, religious, etc. antagonisms. 
So the essence never appears directly, but always in a displaced, distorted way. While this statement is in principle true, there are at least two things to add to it. First, if this is the case, why even continue to talk about a fundamental social antagonism? All we have here is a series of antagonisms which can build a chain of equivalences, metaphorically contaminating each other. And which antagonism emerges as central is the contingent result of a struggle for hegemony. So does this mean that one should reject the very notion of fundamental antagonism, as the cloud does? I would propose a Hegelian answer. Let me make this point clear by yet again referring to one of my standard examples, Levi Strauss's exemplary analysis from his structural anthropology of the spatial disposition of buildings among the Winnebago, one of the Great Lake tribes. The tribe is divided into two subgroups, Moetes, those who are from above and those who are from below. When we ask an individual to draw on a piece of paper or on sand the ground plan of her village, the spatial disposition of cottages, we obtain two quite different answers depending on her relationship to one or the other subgroup. Both perceive the village as a circle, but for one subgroup there is within this circle another circle of central houses, so that we have two concentric circles while for the other subgroup the circle is split into two by a clear dividing line. In other words, a member of the first subgroup, let us call it conservative corporatist, perceives the ground plan of the village as a ring of houses more or less symmetrically disposed around the central temple, whereas a member of the second, revolutionary antagonistic subgroup, perceives her village as two distinct heaps of houses separated by an invisible frontier. The point Levi Strauss wants to make is that this example should in no way entice us into cultural relativism, according to which the perception of social space depends on the observer's group belonging. The very split into the two relative perceptions implies a hidden reference to a constant, not the objective, actual disposition of buildings, but a traumatic kernel, a fundamental antagonism the inhabitants of the village were unable to symbolize, to account for, to internalize, to come to terms with an imbalance in social relations that prevented the community from stabilizing itself into a harmonious whole. The two perceptions of the ground plan are simply two mutually exclusive endeavors to cope with this traumatic antagonism, to heal its wound via the imposition of a balanced symbolic structure. It is here that one can see in what precise sense the real intervenes through anamorphosis. We have first the actual, objective arrangement of the houses and then it's two different symbolizations, which both distort, in an anamorphic way, the actual arrangement. However, the real is here not the actual arrangement, but the traumatic core of the social antagonism, which distorts the tribe member's view of the actual antagonism. The real is thus the disavowed X, on account of which our vision of reality is anamorphically distorted. It is simultaneously the thing to which direct access is not possible, and the obstacle which prevents this direct access. The thing which eludes our grasp and the distorting screen, which makes us miss the thing. More precisely, the real is ultimately the very shift of perspective from the first to the second standpoint. The Lacanian real is not only distorted, but the very principle of the distortion of reality. This three-level dispositif is strictly homologous to Freud's three-level dispositif of the interpretation of dreams. For Freud, too, unconscious desire in a dream is not simply its core, which never appears directly, distorted by the translation into the manifest dream text, but the very principle of this distortion. This is how, for Deleuze, in a strict conceptual homology, the economy exerts its role of determining the social structure in the last instance. The economy in this role is never directly present as an actual causal agent. Its presence is purely virtual. It is the social pseudo-cause, but precisely as such, absolute, non-relational, the absent cause, something that is never in its own place. That is why the economic is never given properly speaking, but rather designates a differential virtuality to be interpreted, always covered over by its forms of actualization. It is the absent X which circulates between the multiple series of the social field, 
economic, political, ideological, legal, distributing them in their specific articulation. One should thus insist on the radical difference between the economic as this virtual X, the absolute point of reference of the social field, and the economic in its actuality as one of the elements, subsystems, of the actual social totality. When they encounter each other, that is, when the virtual economic encounters in the guise of its actual counterpart itself, in its oppositional determination, this identity coincides with absolute self-contradiction. As Lacan put it in his Seminar 11, il n'y a de cause que de ce qui gauche. There is no cause but a cause of something that stumbles, slips, falters. A thesis whose obviously paradoxical character is explained when one takes into account the opposition between cause and causality. For Lacan, they are in no way the same, since a cause, in the strict sense of the term, is precisely something which intervenes at the point where the network of causality, the chain of causes and effects, falters, when there is a cut, a gap, in the causal chain. In this sense, a cause is, for Lacan, by definition, a distant cause, an absent cause, as one used to put it in the jargon of the happy structuralist of the 1960s and 1970s. It acts in the interstices of the direct causal network. What Lacan has in mind here is specifically the working of the unconscious. Imagine an ordinary slip of the tongue. At a chemistry conference, someone gives a paper about, say, the exchange of fluids. All of a sudden, he stumbles and makes a slip, blurting out something about the passage of sperm in the sexual act. An attractor, from what Freud called an other scene intervenes like a type of gravity, exerting its invisible influence from a distance, curving the space of the speech flow, introducing a gap into it. What makes this Lacanian thesis so interesting for the philosophical perspective is that it allows us to approach in a new way the old topic of causality and freedom. Freedom is opposed to causality, but not to the cause. The standard political trope, the cause of freedom, should be taken more literally than is usually intended, including both main meanings of the term cause, a cause which produces effects, and a political cause that mobilizes us. Perhaps the two meanings are not as disparate as they may appear. The cause that mobilizes us, the cause of freedom, acts as the absent cause which disturbs the network of causality. It is a cause which makes me free, extracting me from the network of causes and effects. And perhaps this is also how one should understand the infamous Marxist formula of the determination in the last instance. The overdetermining instance of economy is also a distant cause, never a direct one. That is, it intervenes in the gaps of direct social causality. With the class struggle, it is today a little bit like Freud's patient's answer to the question as to the identity of the woman in his dream. Whatever this fight is about, it is not class struggle, but sexism, cultural intolerance, religious fundamentalism. One of the standard topics of post-Marxism is that today, the working class is no longer the predestined revolutionary subject. The contemporary emancipatory struggles are plural, with no particular agent who can claim to occupy a privileged place. The way to answer this reproach is to concede even more. There never was such a privilege of the working class. The key structural role of the working class does not imply this kind of priority. How then does the determining role of economy function if it is not the ultimate referent of the social field? Imagine a political struggle fought in the terms of popular musical culture, as was the case in some post-socialist Eastern European countries, in which the tension in the field of popular music between pseudo-folk and rock functioned as a displacement of the tension between the nationalist conservative right and the liberal left. To put it in old-fashioned terms, a popular cultural struggle expressed, provided the terms in which, a political struggle was fought out. As in the US today, where country music is predominantly conservative and rock predominantly left liberal. Following Freud, 
Is it not enough to say that the struggle in popular music was here only a secondary expression, a symptom, an encoded translation of the political struggle, which was what the whole thing was really about? Both struggles have a substance of their own. The cultural struggle is not just a secondary phenomenon, a battlefield of shadows to be deciphered for its political connotation, which, as a rule, is obvious enough. The determining role of the economy does not mean that, in this case, what all the fuss really was about was the economic struggle, so that we should imagine the economy as a hidden meta-essence, which then expresses itself with a two-level distance in a cultural struggle. It determines politics, which in turn determines culture. On the contrary, the economy ascribes itself in the course of the very translation transposition of the political struggle into the popular cultural struggle, into how this transposition is never direct, but always displaced, asymmetrical. The class connotation, as it is encoded in cultural ways of life, can often turn around the explicit political connotation. Recall how, in the famous presidential TV debate in 1959 responsible for Nixon's defeat, it was the liberal Kennedy who was perceived as an upper-class patrician, while the rightist Nixon appeared as his opponent of more humble origins. This, of course, does not mean that the second opposition simply belies the first one, that it stands for the truth obfuscated by the first, namely that Kennedy, who in his public statements presented himself as Nixon's progressive liberal opponent, in fact signaled through his lifestyle features enacted in the debate that he was really simply an upper-class patrician. But it does mean that the displacement bears witness to the limitation of Kennedy's progressivism, that is, it does point towards the contradictory nature of Kennedy's ideological-political position. And it is here that the determining instance of the economy enters. The economic is the absent cause that accounts for the displacement in representation, for the asymmetry, reversal in this case, between the two series, the couple progressive-conservative politics and the couple upper-middle class. The Leclerian solution would have been to conceive such contaminations as the enchainment of antagonisms into a contingent series of equivalences. The fact that the political opposition left-right contaminates the popular musical opposition of rock and country is a contingent result of the struggle for hegemony, namely that there is no inner necessity for rock to be progressive or for country to be conservative. There is, however, an asymmetry here, that is obfuscated by this straightforward solution. The political struggle is not one among other struggles, in a series alongside artistic, economic, religious, etc. struggles. It is the purely formal principle of antagonistic struggle as such. That is to say, there is no proper content of politics. All political struggles and decisions concern other specific spheres of social life. Taxation, the regulation of sexual mores and procreation, the health service, and so on and so forth. Politics is merely a formal mode of dealing with these topics, insofar as they emerge as topics of public struggle and decision. This is why everything is, or rather can become, political, insofar as it becomes a stake in political struggle. The economy, on the other hand, is not just one of the spheres of political struggle, but the cause of the mutual contamination expression of struggles. To put it succinctly, left-right is the master signifier, contaminated by the series of other oppositions, while the economy is the objet a, the elusive object that sustains this contamination, and when that contamination is directly economic, the economy encounters itself in its oppositional determination. Politics is thus a name for the distance of the economy from itself. Its space is opened up by the gap that separates the economic as the absent cause from the economy in its oppositional determination, as one of the elements of the social totality. There is politics because the economy is non-all, because the economic is an impotent, impassive pseudo-cause. The economic is thus here doubly inscribed in the precise sense which defines the Lacanian real. It is simultaneously the hard core expressed in other struggles through displacements and other forms of distortion, and the very structuring principle 
of these distortions. In its long and twisted history, Marx's social hermeneutics has relied on two logics, which, although often confounded under the ambiguous shared term of the economic class struggle, are completely different. On the one hand, there is the infamous economic interpretation of history. All struggles, artistic, ideological, political, are ultimately conditioned by the economic class struggle, which is their secret meaning to be deciphered. On the other hand, everything is political. That is, the Marxist view of history is thoroughly politicized. There are no social, ideological, cultural, and other phenomena that are not contaminated by the basic political struggle. And this goes even for the economy. The illusion of trade unionism is precisely that the workers' struggle can be depoliticized, reduced to a purely economic negotiation for better work conditions, and so on. However, these two contaminations, the economic determines everything in last instance. Everything is political. Do not obey the same logic. The economy without the extimate political core, class struggle, would be a positive social matrix of development, as it is in the pseudo-Marxist, evolutionary historicist notion of development, to which Marx himself came dangerously close in his preface to the critique of political economy. In the social production of their existence, men inevitably enter into definite relations, which are independent of their will, namely relations of production appropriate to a given stage in the development of their material forces of production. The totality of these relations of production constitutes the economic structure of society, the real foundation, on which arises a legal and political superstructure, and to which correspond definite forms of social consciousness. The mode of production of material life conditions the general process of social, political, and intellectual life. It is not the consciousness of men that determines their existence, but their social existence that determines their consciousness. At a certain stage of development, the material productive forces of society come into conflict with the existing relations of production, or, this merely expresses the same thing in legal terms, with the property relations within the framework of which they have operated hitherto. From forms of development of the productive forces, these relations turn into their fetters. Then begins an era of social revolution. The changes in the economic foundation lead, sooner or later, to the transformation of the whole immense superstructure. In studying such transformations, it is always necessary to distinguish between the material transformation of the economic conditions of production, which can be determined with the precision of natural science, and the legal, political, religious, artistic, or philosophic, in short, ideological forms, in which men become conscious of this conflict and fight it out. Just as one does not judge an individual by what he thinks about himself, so one cannot judge such a period of transformation by its consciousness. But, on the contrary, this consciousness must be explained from the contradictions of material life from the conflict existing between the social forces of production and the relations of production. No social order is ever destroyed before all the productive forces for which it is sufficient have been developed, and new superior relations of productions never replace older ones before the material conditions for their existence have matured within the framework of the old society. The evolutionist logic of these lines is clear. The motor of social progress is the apolitical development of the forces and means of production. They determine the relations of production, and so on. On the other hand, pure politics, decontaminated from the economy, is no less ideological. Vulgar economism and ideological-political idealism are two sides of the same coin. The structure is here that of an inward loop. The class struggle is politics in the very heart of the economic. Or, to put it paradoxically, one can reduce all political, juridical, cultural content to the economic base, deciphering it as its expression. All except class struggle, which is the political in the economic itself. Mutatis mutandis, the same holds for psychoanalysis. All dreams have sexual content, except 
explicitly sexual dreams. Why? Because the sexualization of a context is formal, the principle of its distortion. Through repetition, the oblique approach, and so on, every topic, inclusive of sexuality itself, is sexualized. The ultimate properly Freudian lesson is that the explosion of human symbolic capacities does not merely expand the metaphoric scope of sexuality. Activities that are in themselves thoroughly asexual can become sexualized. Everything can be eroticized and start to mean that. But much more importantly, this explosion sexualizes sexuality itself. The specific quality of human sexuality has nothing to do with the immediate, rather stupid, reality of copulation, including the preparatory mating rituals. It is only when animal coupling gets caught in the self-referential vicious cycle of the drive, in the protracted repetition of its failure to reach the impossible thing, that we have what we call sexuality. That is, that sexuality itself becomes sexualized. In other words, the fact that sexuality can spill over and function as a metaphoric content of every other human activity is not a sign of its power, but on the contrary a sign of its impotence, failure, its inherent blockage. The class struggle is thus a unique mediating term which, while mooring politics in the economy, all politics is ultimately an expression of class struggle, simultaneously stands for the irreducible political moment in the very heart of the economic.